Hello, and welcome back to the Crown Yourself podcast. And whew, do I have an episode that is just about to stir your soul? Because if you have ever hesitated on sharing your story, on fearing that there are parts of yourself that, or parts of your past experiences that are shameful or should be perceived with guilt or should be perceived with shame, then my guest, Kalpashri Gupta, is going to bring it home for you in this episode where we discuss how to merge your past with the future that you're creating and consciously designing for yourself. Now, I will let you know that on this episode, as a trigger warning, we do talk about childhood sexual abuse, as both Kalpa and I have experienced that. And we talk about it from the perspective of having healed those relationships on what it means to be on the other side of forgiveness. And you may not be there yet if that's something that happened to you, and that's okay. And whatever comes up for you as you listen to this interview, I want you to know that's okay too. I will leave the name and contact info for one of the greatest therapists that I recommend, who was also a guest on this podcast, and she's also worked with me a few times, Dr. Jane. And should you need that, that support is there in the resources. Kalpa is the founder and CEO of Connext. And prior to launching her business for 15 years, she helped GE, American Express, Zelle, Early Warning Services, Bristol Myers, Squibb, and Mayo Clinics increase revenues and profitability through strategy, consulting, and diverse operational roles in product management, marketing, analytics, and fraud and risk management. Basically, she's a corporate badass. She started her career in research and consulting with NCAER, a leading think tank in India. But beyond her accomplishments in her career, Kalpa is led by her deep purpose to serve marginalized, abused children and women. And she's also a singer, which is really cool because I tell all my clients, like, have a hobby. And it was beautiful seeing Kalpa's voice, both in sharing her story and the power that came through with that, and her voice and urge to sing also came through, through the course of our work together. And it is beautiful to see her transformation on the other side. She has now spoken at Google and Microsoft and is training amazing, high achieving women who have experienced either workplace trauma or childhood past trauma to achieve with alignment now. And so it is my pleasure that I give you Kalpashtri Gupta. Welcome to the Crown Yourself podcast, where together we build your empire and transform your subconscious stories about what's possible for your business, body, and life. I'm your host, Kimberly Spencer, founder of crownyourself.com, and I'm a master mindset coach, best-selling author, TEDx speaker, known to my clients as a game changer. Each week, you get the conscious leadership strategies you need to help you reign with courage, clarity, and confidence so that you too can make the income and impact you deserve. Imagine this podcast as your royal invitation to step into your full potential and reign in your divine purpose. Your sovereignty starts here and your reign is now. Alpha, it is my honor to have you on the Crown Yourself podcast. Welcome. Hi, Kimberly. It's a joy. It's a joy to always talk to you. Oh, so let's let's dive in because you experienced a lot of trauma as a child. You experienced significant childhood sexual abuse, and this is not something that is, you know, not not public. Like you, over the course of our journey together, you started really sharing your story. And can you tell me a bit about what that did for you? Yeah, I mean, I we were talking about it. So today is also my son's birthday, right? So like, I'm just looking back at some of the journey that started in our in my path to motherhood. And as we were working together, I hadn't, I had probably just shared that with my husband at the time and people in my family, close family. And I was in the process of like really figuring out why do I want to share? So it wasn't so much about like from a place of shame, blame, or guilt, although I was stuck in there, but like, if I am going to share, what's the purpose? And I think part of it was being a mom, that was the purpose that, you know, we want to 
so much of trauma that we have, but we are also resilient. You know, we also create um, our trauma. Some of the coping mechanism have also served me. So through working with you at the time, I think I was able to peel a lot of those layers from a place of like having more compassion for me and going, hey, like what's the worst that can happen from here? Like as moms, when we like, I almost think of us as women that have had trauma in our beautiful like way, ways we have birthed the baby. It's almost like you're birthing a new world in which they can thrive in their next decade, their next you know, 30 years, their next 60 years. So yeah, it's been transformative from the place of uh, my relationships have evolved. Like I'm transported back to a time came where I was sitting on the couch um, about five years ago with my husband and I had postponed some things. And now when I look back, I feel like that constant feeling of like hiding, like I'm not enough, that is gone. Or, or if it comes, like I notice so quickly, I mean, these patterns are ingrained, but I notice this and I'm like, what in this moment am I making it about me? So I think that's, that's been beautiful. Like, yeah. Yeah. And the, I mean, cause you had only recently started sharing, but you've, you've been married for a while. And so your husband never knew for a good part of your, your marriage. And now how has your relationship developed in, in your own vulnerability and, and courage to share and to courage, courage to also share so publicly as well. Yeah, you know, it's I, I'm surprised I've surprised myself, right? Because <laughs> even as I talk about it, it's almost like we went through so much together. We've known each other now for almost 17 years now. Like, yeah, uh, I lose track. Um, and we had um, I don't know that I had shared with very few people. I shared with very few people, and in the past. When I met him, I made the story about, hey, this is a thing of the past and he doesn't need to know. Now imagine, like I wanted to transport you back to that person, you know, who had a heartbreak in her life, who was talking to people and attracting like some wrong people and she shared and then realized what's the point because this person turned out to be a cheater. Like, why do I need to care about this? This thing is a past, like doesn't matter. And these are people that I knew who had abused me, like a 90% of the cases, that's what happens. So from there, when I met my husband, we went through infertility journey together. Like I wasn't able to conceive for a while. So I was going through that process of, you know, even fertility treatments. And like, it was just traumatic from that, like from both our perspective, he just, he would feel like I'm pushing him away, right? From, a, from both from a mentally and then physically. And I think um, I never really sat down to reflect about that until like in the last few years, right? That like now having shared that with him, you know, uh, like he's able to see things in a very different context, right? Like there would be times where, you know, like that feeling of, you know, achievement or like that hypervigilance, suddenly I'm making it about, I'm not feeling heard, I'm not loved, I am like all the same stories come up and it gives him a little bit of perspective to just, just hold me, just hold me there, you know? And I think that's such a beautiful place to be, like where we can share that intimacy, we can talk about it and not just him, like just in general in my family, they have taken it beautifully. So it's just personally very, it feels very supported. Oh, I, I, I so admire your courage. Uh, Cause I remember when I first told my mom at 17 about my father and I was like, it was, it was one of the hardest conversations that I've ever had. So I was terrified of what the outcome was going to be, but I had to like, I had to share it. And the beauty of what transpired out of that, of just, you know, there, there was a, a a vulnerability and an opening in our family where suddenly this, the, cause shame loves secrets, right? And so being able to unlock that shame and let it see the light of day, let it see the light of love and have that healing is so powerful. And you, your journey is so interesting because the, the experiences you had as a child, you didn't know were correlating initially 
into certain circumstances in work environments. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, totally. Like, I think that's been the, like, you know, I am a researcher also from like, you know, like just, just the temperament of what I do. Right? Well, like, you were in a huge think tank in India. Yeah. So. <laughs> I started my career, like I studied economics and then I was drawn into many different areas from research to, you know, brand management to consulting and a large career, part of my career has been product, product development. And when there was a point in my life when my son was three and I had taken a huge role and then I was completely burnt out. And I used to measure my worth with my performance, my title. And as much as I'm internally motivated, that's the context in which we operate in our environments. And I found myself like completely burnt out. I quit my job. And uh, from a trauma perspective, that journey led me to, in that moment, also working with a coach at the time. And I realized like, when you go through so much pain, that's where we find my purpose. And I was actually serving a foster care um, a volunteer that serves kids in the foster care. And through the volunteering work, I found that adverse childhood experiences, they shape us. And I came, I went there to actually give something. And I found this whole knowledge around so much of research that was done by CDC and Kaiser Permanente in the late 90s around the adverse childhood experiences, uh, like both three, three things, like around abuse, neglect, and family dysfunction. And that was later expanded. Um, so there are basically 10 criteria, you know, around whether you had sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, and there's a whole list. And you can literally score yourself and find out what patterns you have, right? What scores you have. Anything more than four is like super high risk. And but the thing that I want people to know is even with one, if you had any kind of adversity, it, it's very common, you know, more than two thirds of people have had some challenges. And what's not people don't know is when you have had these experiences, your brain's wiring changes. So the thing that I realized is I was tolerating a lot in my life. Like I was tolerating people like, uh, I was making some stories also about them, like, oh, they are mean, they are this way, they are sabotaging. And I'm not saying none of that doesn't happen. But what I'm saying is there was also, I was also partly responsible for why I was there. For me, it was, hey, this job provides me security. After many years of being an immigrant, a mom, it pays me well. I can take care of my family. I can travel. But end of the day, none of it was worth my mental peace. It just mm -hmm. wasn't, right? So, uh, because what I realize is, you know, as much as externally you put up, then everything comes up on your child. And that's not, that's the re interesting that I found in my journey. And that is the common story when I speak to many mom, like they didn't know, even within my friends and like clients, when I share about how childhood adversity affects your professional journey, that's, that gets people to go, what? This is why? Yeah. And especially that we'll leave a link in the description to the, to the ACE, the ACE score. Cause, um, that, that when you score a four or five, you're at severe, it literally says you're at severe risk for anxiety and depression later on in life. And it's, if you have a higher score than that, like a higher than that, it is, you know, severe risk. And so, like mine was an eight. <laughs> so that experience of being able to recognize, oh my gosh, it's, it's not just me. It's not an identity thing. Mm -hmm. It's a circumstance thing that shaped how my identity is. It's the chicken or the egg, right? Mm -hmm. Of the circumstances in which you experience shape your identity. And then your identity then shapes your circumstance. So how did you start creating and breaking the pattern to allow for this beautiful transformation where you're able to have a deep, intimate relationship with your husband, a career that's fulfilling you. I mean, you've spoken now at Google and Microsoft and, you know, being a, a wonderful mom, being here on a podcast, sharing your story on your son's birthday. Yeah, I don't know. I think somehow I probably kept my inner child alive. And I think part of it is like, I was having this beautiful conversation the other day. Sometimes people that go through life's like toughest moments, they are the most joyful because you realize that 
everything, every day is a blessing. Like the fact that you and I can sit right now and have a laptop, like talk across, like use technology, like there's just so much going well in our lives and we forget that, right? So I think a lot of it was also working through with you and several other resources um, came like in terms of designing my day, it's like, if I'm not filling my tank, if I'm not taking control of my mornings, and when I go to bed, like the, the, I'm giving everybody from an empty cup, right? So in the past, it used to be a lot about like, oh, wake up and take care. Like the first thing as a mom, you could probably roll it, like you wake up and wake up your son, even before brushing the, your own teeth sometimes, like go and can you brush your teeth? Like, okay, get, get them. Sometimes he just wakes me up. <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, I think part of it has been, also like waking up, how can I wake up more earlier? You know, how can I just have us enjoy a cup of tea? Like, how can I just listen to my favorite music? You know, I love singing. Like, how do I fill up those, you know, um, those times? Um, and I think that has been like really transformative uh, personally, like bringing in some structure in my day to provide calm. Like I am also, I, I'm, I won't say I was depressed. I'm more like anxiety, like the future mm -hmm. of like, next what's next so part of uh, that has been like sitting in meditation in the morning you know journaling like these are some like life skills um or tools I would say that that have really supported me but I think a lot of the things that when we did some of the deeper sessions around like neuro-linguistic programming hypnosis like oh my god the quality of conversations that I had with my family of origin and understanding their trauma like I had around the time when I shared my story, my mom opened up and said she was abused mm -hmm. and she's in her 60s and she had never told that person. She's been married to my husband for my, my not my husband, her husband, like my dad right now for almost 40 years, over 40, right? So, um, and she was, she was able to open up. And so I think the, you know, I found you were asking about the process, but I think part of what I'm bringing home here is it's having that compassion for me has been the most life-changing that I also get to fill my tank. I also get to share, like I was the, all this while I was operating as the parent in my relationships. And how do I just start to claim that part of me that is also the child right now, you know, and always yeah. been yeah, and being able to to bridge that gap between who who your future self is and and that inner child who who had those big dreams, who had those 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 visions, but who also had experienced some stuff. Mm -hmm. And in that in that bridging of the gap, that there's great healing. And I know that as a mom, for me, like when I've when I've had the the privilege of being coached by my children. <laughs> Every day, right? Every, Every day, day, right? <laughs> of just having those reflections in my face and, and being able to reflect on, okay, how is this me? How is what this behavior, why is that triggering a response within me? What am I ignoring within myself? And being able to allow for that, that transformation of my own internal environment to be able to bring greater peace to my to my child. And it sounds like with what, what you've been able to do is recognize those external environmental triggers. Like when you quit your job that were exacerbating the problem, even if you weren't quite clear on what the problem was. And so how does one go about recognizing those external environmental triggers without putting on the shame, you know, the, the blame of, Oh, they're, per that person is just mean, or that person is just a jerk. Oh. I wish everybody could go through. I, I I do believe everyone, like that's the world I dream of, but the reality is it does take a little bit of a courage and sometimes, oftentimes, a little bit of a crisis where every coping mechanism that people have developed up until that point stops serving. Mm -hmm. Just doesn't work. And they're like, you know what? What more can go wrong? I don't care after this. Like, you know, so, or I want a better life. They want want to really desire something better for themselves right and the process from that point can be many fold you know like if people have different paths but what I'm working with clients and you know like our discussion and many other what I do know the first at somewhere 
it starts with some form of release, whether it's forgiving yourself or just being open to that idea, right? Mm -hmm. Starting to share with a very few people, perhaps, which it could be a therapist, a friend you trust, a coach you hire, right? And usually, I think a combination of those. And the third is the sharing takes a little bit of a courage and, and sharing uh, from a sharing perspective, it's more around when you realize when you truly forgive yourself and don't judge, I think sharing becomes easier. Because for me, it's like, that's the process. Like you, you forgive yourself, you talk to a few people, you figure out like, what, is there any charge in that that's remaining? Or as you are going to you know, share with other people who you hone your ability to be able to hold the space because not everybody is going to respond to the mm -hmm. way you want. In my case, when I shared with my mom, like she's like, but you were a teenager by then, like couldn't, you couldn't have run away or did you? I mean, that was her first, first response. Like she was empathetic, but then she was like, she just blurted out, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, mom, trust me. Like that thought always came to me. And that was one of the reasons I told myself, right? That That's one of the things I used to tell myself that I was at fault. I was to blame. Mm -hmm. I was the one who's, you know, just sat there, right? But that's not true. Like you also miss some things here, not from a shame or blame perspective. So I think part of, uh, from a process is, yeah, compassion, core group, and then you start sharing. Yeah, I think that's such that's such a key point because that natural question of like and it, it's it's our just world bias which we you know I know we've talked about many times of like we we naturally have this this bias in our brains and it's that like young inner child voice it's like it's not fair and so when something happens that's so atrocious that you're like it's not fair our our just world bias is trying to rationalize in some way oh they must have been able, to, they must have kind of caused it in some way, even even when we do that with ourselves. I mean, I got to the point where when I had to look at my sexual abuse when I was 24, um, and I, I had to look up the definition of rape to make sure. <laughs> like I, I was like, well, oh my gosh, like that that's actually what happened and why that had bothered me so much and why that experience had, had really bothered me. And I had to look at, I had to look up the definition that's the just world bias taking play. And that's why we hear like in the news when pe people say, oh, she must've been wearing, you know, a, a really short skirt or she shouldn't have been dressing so promiscuous or she must've been asking for it. Like, like idiotic things, like statements like that. It's not necessarily idiotic. It's just everybody's inner child who's wanting it to, who's wanting the world to be a fair and just place. And when we hear something that's so opposite of that, we're, it's our logic, logical minds are trying to make sense of it. And so I love that you were able to have the compassion for your mother to be able to like recognize that that was your own story and the compassion for yourself too. I would love you to walk us through what is your process for forgiveness? Because it seems easy to say, oh, forgive yourself. But is that repeating affirmations to yourself? Is that prayer? Is that um, a feeling? What, what is your process? Hmm. So for me, the one key question that I periodically ask is, if this were to happen to somebody else that I love, either it's my best friend or my son, like, what would I tell them? Mm. Like, just look at yourself. Like, like, I, I, like, that's what triggered, started, helped me in that forgiveness. Like I, my son was two or three and that's where like, I started going, oh my God, like if something were to happen to him, would I talk to him the way I talk to me? Like, like I started becoming open to the idea. So whether you are a parent, mom, or whether you don't have a child, you must know some child, you know, um, just think about that child you were and like, how would you talk to that person if something like this were to happen? Like, I bet you, you, you're the inner words that you have, like, oh, you must have caused it. You were wearing this. You were like, you wanted attention. It was feeling good. You won't be so cruel. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the first one, a question like I offer. The other part is like journaling. And for me, it was like venting. I remember reading a book by Desmond Tutu, like a book of forg forgiving, like it had so many exercises. One of the things that stood out was like carrying, like try carrying like a 
some pebbles in your hand for some day, some, some time, and they just carry them around. And how does it feel? And I might be butchering the exact thing, but in spirit, like I literally carried some of that for a while. And then he's like, okay, then drop them in the garden, bury that, bury it. And I was like, wow. Yeah. Like this thing happened in the past. I am not saying that this was fair or you deserved it, or that person, I'm not absolving the other person of their guilt, their, their share of in, in creating that. What I'm saying is, since then, if you're alive, you are alive. And if you're listening, there's something going right in your life. And you have, you can always powerfully make that shift to go, what do I want my next phase of life to be? How long is it enough for me to just, just stay stuck in that person? Like they did it. Yes, they did it. But now what, look at what you are doing to yourself. So mm. those are the two things that I would offer from a, from a forgiveness perspective um, and journaling, like venting out, like you don't have to write a letter to send it to them, but like write it. In my case, I ended up finally having a lot of conversations, whether it was the my abusers or also in some workplace cases, some conversations that I was carrying a lot of charge. And 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 I feel free. Like I literally right now I have no, yeah, it doesn't hold me. I I I claim my power from that sense. So I from forgiveness, that's the process. And it takes, I mean. I am in awe of your courage because to have the conversations with those who've hurt you is divine. Like it, it truly is like, there's that statement that um, to err is to, is to be human, but to forgive is divine. And that act of, of forgiveness and cleansing yourself so that it's a choice to no longer hold that and, and carry it around with you to let that define your future. And I'd love to know, because when people start sharing their stories, then sometimes there's the identification with that being their story. And thus, because they're sharing their stories, that they're carrying that around with them, whether that's like going on podcast interviews or giving TED Talks or whatnot. So how do you de-identify with the story of your past to a space in which that you recognize that it happened, it's a place of acceptance, but it's not an attachment. A great question, Kim. And I'm in awe of you too, like for your bravery, like just the way you are supporting people. And that it's an identity. I think that the, the one thing I would offer is the growth mindset about you, about like your own identity. So for me, I didn't have the label. So I worked in the corporate America, but I didn't have the label, you know, those that vocabulary of gaslighting or, mm. you know, like toxicity at the time or like racism, but like, yes, I knew, but then a lot of, lot of things have evolved in the last four years. So it was like when those definitions came and I was like, oh, wow, like that's what I was going through. So just separating, okay, but then this is, this is systemic and like separating that from a personal perspective, it was like, oh my God, like, I didn't have the survivor identity. I literally didn't. And it, it it's almost like when you have a disease or some, you know, you go to a doctor, they diagnose and you're like, ah, oh, so I have this knee pain and it's because of arthritis. So, okay, but you are not your arthritis. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you are this person who's having this condition. Same way, sexual abuse survivor. You, yes, you've survived, but you don't need to stay stuck in that it gives you a frame of reference to okay here are the things that what that means for you like you may feel like hyper vigilant you might be operating from always like achievement like never feeling enough and um always looking for that you know trigger like threat like where that tiger isn't even there but how like it's a choice to use that survivor identity or not for me i move very quickly through that Mm -hmm. I moved very quickly, partly because I was investing me in me. Like for me, I was no longer going to tolerate, you know, some parts of me staying secret that were actually holding me back from my power. Because I think the point where I got in my life was like, 
this like I was always a good student like and part of whether you know that's the identity we make our about ourselves right and at one point my identity like what I was thinking I am wasn't matching with the internal reality of how I was feeling and that needed to shift mm -hmm. so um separating yourself from your identity it's almost like a different hat that we have mm -hmm. like I, I am I'm a mom I'm an immigrant here's my business here's I'm a friend but there is a core reality of who I am. I am loving. I am powerful. I'm compassionate. I'm courageous. And no matter what my circumstances are, I can, people can still feel my love, you know? Mm -hmm. And I love that in the words and how you defined yourself of the, the, the superior I, the highest self I, in a way, it's present terms it's not like you you're loved it's like no it's not in the past it's like you're loving you're compassionate you're powerful and and those words bring a presence to the reality of who is you that's beyond the circumstances of experience and I think I would encourage everyone to listen to the words and how you're defining your present reality is it based on circumstance or is it is it in the moment as to how you are being, because, you know, I operate from the, the be, do, have model mm -hmm. of just like, it's who you be that creates what you do that then creates what you have. And so many of us, we work it backwards. And when we work it backwards, we think, oh, I have to be loved in order to be loving. I have to be powerful and have all these accolades in order to, you know, feel powerful. No, no, no. The power comes from within. The, the love comes from within. It's from who you be that exudes out of you. And that's what you just are a walking testimony for that. I mean, I love every time I see your face, Cal, but like you are always just this really, no matter what the circumstances are, you have this depth of love and care that I do believe really, you know, similar to what you said earlier comes because you've experienced the opposite when you've experienced the flip side of the coin of the hardships and the challenges and the abuse, and you can see how life is precious. Oh, totally. Right. Like, and uh, you reminded me it's the affirmations. It's a, a lot of our life has actually been about like just experiencing adversity, making some meaning out of it, and then repeating those over and over again. So to decondition from that, like it's those affirmations, like from who you are, like be, and then what actions you take, and that creates the reality what you have. So I uh, love you for highlighting that. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I have you... it's all around my desk. People can see it right now, but yeah. yeah. How did you have to decondition yourself from the workplace, from um and rebuild yourself as an entrepreneur oh I think I remember that conversation we had like which is like um hey like can you detach yourself from your identity of like who you are from your business from everything and I was like holy shit yeah <laughs> and I think that's just been one of my most powerful like memories from working with you like that identity and um, and I think that's become like in great in, in some ways I tie that back to the growth mindset because one of my values is also naturally very curious. I am, so I am testing in my life continually, like, you know, what are my core beliefs about me? Um, I was born and raised in a rural mining town in India. Like I didn't speak the languages I do. Like I, English was not my first language I studied. I, I didn't speak until I was 16, but there was a lot of stories that I carried that I'm not good in communicating or I am not good enough, I, my messages don't land. And that's the energy with which I was actually operating for a long time. And that's no longer the case because the evidence is like so much against that. And I'm also a statistician from, you know, like economy. I studied economics and mathematics and all of that. So I look at also from a process wise, like, okay, what am I making about the situation right now that is not true? So an identity is the same, right? The more, particularly for self-development junkies, like, you know, where can I test? Where can I grow? And I think um, that's the most beautiful part here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love, uh, Brenda Burchard put it, I forget the exact word he used, but he said, 
pers- I think it was personal insecurities versus market realities. Like, and I love that it's, it's not that you said that you led with necessarily faith, you led with data and with proof and looking at the circumstances of, you know, what you've been able to create and, and do, and how you've been able to communicate and the results, the outcomes, not necessarily achievements, but like, I mean, some definite achievements and some, just if we were to categorize them as just like outcomes, like the outcomes of what you've been able to create with your life and with your business. And, and it, it's, it's phenomenal because you have that data and you have that proof. I mean, hello, you spoke at Google and Microsoft, <laughs> like, and, and you're, you're speaking around the world now. And so that, that ability to say, like, it's not necessarily faith. It's like, look at the actual data from a statistical standpoint and see what, what is, what is the data showing? Yeah. And, and you bring up such a good point, Kim, also for women, like how many, like I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday from like 20 years, like probably nearly years ago where we were in Bangalore and she, uh, as they are navigating some child career transitions and she's like, I was so inspired by your podcast. I saw this and like, I am navigating. So it's just fulfilling that people, like, if I am experiencing this, there are a lot of women who are perhaps immigrant people of color, like they are experiencing certain realities. So when you reach out to people, right, I'm leading with the data, like in service of also, there are so many other people who are feeling the same way, right? Um, On the identity aspect that you touched upon earlier, uh, and then, then the brands, one of my identities was, whoa, I work with all these big brands. I work with GE, American Express, Dell, you know, BMS, like, and at some point, like, I see so many achievers, like, making this about that job and that, oh, who am I if I'm not this? And I think a key part of the identity separation is also, like, you are more than your job and your title, right? Mm-hmm. So intentionally, it's become also, like, yes, I, I get thrilled based on the impact it makes, the scale it provides, but and also personally, uh, it, it, I would say it's still a little bit harder, hard, right? But I notice that more and more and go, okay, it's separate. It, that identity is separate from who I am. How do you separate them? Oh, oh God. It's, it's <laughs> almost like, uh, it's almost like in the morning, like waking up saying some affirmations for me. When I enter my office, I have some things here where I look at and I go, oh, this is my work. But I think it gets very entangled and I'm learning even as an entrepreneur. I think the path to entrepreneurship is a path to spirituality. Like it I completely in- agree. <laughs> One told me like two years ago and I was like, okay. And, and I like, and I've done like work besides working with you. There's just so many other areas that I've invested in and the things really from a tactical perspective, and I'm a very tactical for strategy, I can give you strategy, but the daily tips, it's almost like, okay, when I open my computer, like, what do I see, right? Do I have something written there? I have notebooks like that are lying next to my bed, like, which is probably an affirmation journal around different areas of my life. Like, what am I saying? What am I? And, and that sets the tone for me in terms of priorities. So for me, it's like my spirituality, then my relationship with my husband, my relationship with my son, how I'm showing up in my communities, and lastly, my business and vocation, that is what makes me a full, complete, whole person. So being very intentional about, okay, the, the, like how I'm setting up time in my calendar, that, that needs to get reflected with the identity that I feel like, that I believe I'm living, right? So mm-hmm. I think that's the, the tactical separation from blocking my time and like affirmations around those areas like is how I operate but the going gets tough when some things are not working you know some when some things are not working it's just we get into that space but then again reminding and I think it's just coaches like you coaches like other like coaches also have coaches Coaches like you too coaches like me coaches like you know my personal board of advisors like there are like just so many ways but finding that accountability is so important because you know, like there's this notion here, like most most corporate America, like this individual 
you know individuality and that's more like very very common to like um, western cultures like Mm -hmm. you are like self-made you are like resilient you overcome but nobody like you see the success story but nobody gets there alone there are like so many failures along the way in like uh, am I perfect in separating my identity absolutely not even I get tripped up right so I find any kind of accountability you know um for anyone who is actually trying to separate that identity. Yeah, and I think that that's that's really the concept of of how a queen rolls because a queen has from the moment that she's born has a board of advisors in essence that have an expectation of her identity as queen. As a baby, like she's like they they see that she will one day rule. And that expectation of of because there is the egoic expectation of, oh, I should have achieved X, Y, Z by X, Y, Z. But then there's the the higher self expectation of holding yourself to a higher degree of excellence um, and standards and integrity than, than maybe you have in the past. Like that to me is what how I redefine expectation rather than it being, oh, I should be here by X, Y, and Z. And I'm not uh, versus I see where I want to go and I have the expectation of myself and I surround myself with those people who have the same expectation that if I'm not leaning into who I am, like Spike has the full permission um, to, uh, to tell me and uh, you know ask the question so that I can reflect on, am I being a motherfucking queen bitch? <laughs> like, he, has, he has full permission to ask that question from me at any time where I'm in a state of doubting myself or doubting the the what I believe are the, the divine dreams that, that are placed on our heart to go for something bigger. Beautiful. Uh, and I think it's, it's great that you're call, bringing that up because a lot of our relationships are call it closest relationships. They are, they can either be the supporter or they can be the drowner. Right. Mm. And, and I think that's the beauty of like working on my relationship with my husband. Like and when he brings up anything like any criticism, like not seeing that as a criticism, because a lot of us do get tripped up. And in I remember a few earlier on, like I would be like, oh, I don't want to share. Right. But now it's almost like, duh, I didn't think about that. Why did I not think about that? And or not getting staying stuck, but going, OK, the, here's another perspective. Right. So for me, with me and my husband, it's almost like we are very different people. So he brings, and that makes us strong. So when he says something, I'm like, and if it hurts, it's like, ooh, what part of me doesn't quite believe that it's getting amplified through him right now? Because you know what, if something hurts, there is healing to be done and there is self-doubt there. So that's, and that's the role, I think, the accountability with whether it's the partner or people that in your life they play. Like if something lands, it's like you get to go there to go through to the other side. Yeah. And so how do you feel about like our current culture where we like so many people it ha- say, are very trigger happy where they experience a lot of triggers and like what what are you seeing as a common cultural standard and how can we create greater healing within ourselves rather than um, creating greater division? So uh, I have so many thoughts. I think we'll need a separate podcast for that. <laughs> I think here is your soapbox and go. <laughs> Here's the soapbox, right? Um, I think the trigger is essentially our inability to actually take a hard look at ourselves, period, right? And I used to be that person, right? I was very righteous. Like, yes, I'm good at certain things, but I'm also righteous. Like, oh, I don't expect any less than this from this person. Or if I, and I'm equally hard on myself. So I think, but the lens with which I say trigger is like, for me, I'll share from my perspective, right? So I was triggered in workplaces, like some things were not happening. And then as I was going through my own healing, learning about ACEs. I remember one of my coaches just saying, hey, I work with people who have experienced. And I was like, I don't even know why they're mentioning. I'm like, it's a thing of the past. So, but I was triggered. I remember going home that night and crying like so badly, like so badly. And that led, and this person had to then um, like check on me and I couldn't call anyone. And they actually sent me a suicide prevention number, like all kinds of resources. Cause uh, I was like complete mess. 
Now, you could say I was triggered if they did the right thing, or you could look, I, I, I choose to view that if that person hadn't shared in the course, course of that conversation, that sometimes there's that pattern that exists, I wouldn't be here. Mm. Right. So when I share with people, it's that lens, you know, like I remember when, even when I started sharing, I mean, my mom, the conversation with my mom was like the first, you know, and then externally, I remember I did a talk and one of the persons in that mastermind conversation as we were having reached out and said, hey, you should talk only at education and other places. And I had a choice point to make at that time, right? Choice to make. I remember reaching out to you and a few others and going, God, like, what do I do? Like, am I showing with compassion here? Or am I like, do I retreat here and not share? And I realized the evidence then was again, way more people actually were encouraged. They found hope. I even signed on clients from that conversation, right? So where do I go? Like, yes, people will be triggered, but then if many people are finding resources and that they are taking the action to actually heal, I would live for that world any day that focus on like, because then that trigger is only going to keep us here. It's going to cause wars. We just are unwilling to look at our own families and ourselves to create, be that force of grounding where, you know, all the misinformation, mistrust that's getting caused, we are just pushing the blame on somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that's not happening anymore in my watch, in my own like family and relationships, people that I deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I, I love your, your definition of triggering, because I think, especially when you can look at that internal trigger, I remember when, uh, when I was engaged and I put quotes around it, cause I just didn't tell anyone that I was actually married. Um, but I ran off and I had gotten married and everyone thought I was engaged for like a year. And my aunt had heard me have conversations with my ex and she said something very harsh at the time, but I'm so grateful for. And she said, I hope you believe in divorce. <laughs> and I was so triggered. I was deeply triggered and I felt angry and pissed and sad and like, oh my gosh, so, so self-righteous because I had made my decision and I ran off. But in reflection, you know, nine months later, the, the marriage ended. Um, I chose to end it. And and that experience, I was like, oh, I'm, I am so grateful to her for being the only one in my life that at that point had the courage to be like, to say it really challengingly. Because some people are like, well, are you sure? Just because they, like our conversations with my ex were always very, like so much screaming, so much shouting, um, very much like not how I am today. And so, and especially not how my relationship was with my husband. I think we've had like, 10 fights, <laughs> maybe in 10, 11 years. Um, but that, that experience of just having that trigger is something that hit me so deep. Like I remember the moment and I had to really do some deep exploration as to what, why that made me so mad. And when I started to realize, oh, it's because she was seeing what I was choosing not to see. She was seeing what I was choosing to tolerate. And then I saw the reflection in her own life with her own relationship with her husband, which wasn't very good. And I said, wow, she has 40 years of being in, in that type of marriage. And I real that she was a part of my breakthrough, but it came with the, the ability. And I'm so grateful to you when um, I was like, that came with the ability to take that cold, hard look in the mirror and say like, oh, okay, how how am I receiving this information? Why am I, why is this information actually really landing? Because mm -hmm. I love the word that you've, you've said of like looking at, does that thing have charge to it? Does that experience have charge? What, how do you, how do you define charge? Like, is it a somatic experience? Is it like an emotional experience? Like, what is that experience of charge so that we can pick up when we experience those triggers that actually are a key to our own healing yeah it's a somatic experience it's a it's an emotion like you do feel emotions it's energy emotion and and your body is typically so for me it's like my I'm feeling like choked and suddenly like you know like like my chest is like oh my god like they, they like I want to say but I can't but did they just say it like oh my I'm mad and then my cheeks are like 
like hot and I'm like look my eyes are like book if the person is looking at me I'm like look like are you crazy I'm giving that yeah. look right and um <laughs> And sometimes it can be for many women, sometimes anger more than rather than getting angry, crying is easy. Mm. Because we are whole because we are conditioned so socially to not express anger. For men, the hurt is like anger, like they will throw things, they will scream, they will like it's like righteous. So each also we also have conditioning. And then each individual family and person can be conditioned to express in a way. But for me, it's that moment, like what is what what am I feeling in my body right mm -hmm. and what is it like from an anger level where am I right so because and those are the two things that I noticed so um from a trigger yeah it's 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 like for me I used to be that person like all the time like crying mostly and I won't say all the time but usually the anger was crying was the easily accessible mm -hmm. thing for me and now it's not as much even as after all this shedding I still get emotional like I have very which is a superpower for me and I would say from a notice perspective, it's it's like, ooh, am I talking too fast, right? Or am I suddenly not breathing? Like right now, I noticed I was talking too fast. I am so passionate. So I just took a little bit of a deep breath. And I'm like, it's a, an amazing yeah. thing right now. Yeah. So that is exactly your triggers may feel like. And I think, you bring to light, help us this, the idea of sensing of that felt sense mm -hmm. of what is your body trying to communicate to, to you? And there was, um, I love what you said about anger because I was actually the opposite. Um, it was very, I was trained, programmed and played my own plagiarized programming from an early age that crying was manipulative and that that was a form of manipulation. So I wasn't, I, I would get I would have negative experiences if I showed tears and emotion, but anger, that was, I'm an Enneagram eight, that, that, <laughs> that was easier for me. And that experience of, of being able to learn how my anger, like, what was I really angry about? Well, what, when I really got to look back at it and reflect at it, it was, I was angry about the circumstances that I was, I was angry that I felt like I was being the only one being like, look, the emperor has no clothes. Like, Mm -hmm. this is, this is a problem like this, it, that kid in that story. And I've saying, you know, being the one who's like, no, my dad, he's, he's drunk. <laughs> like he's coming home drunk. And those experiences of being able to, to share that and that almost righteous anger and a great book that I read called rage becomes her helped me make friends with my anger again, and then recognize, and it was actually through uh, my acting classes that allowed me to open up my heart and feel and feel deeply and feel the love. And now my kids know that like, <laughs> they ask it, they're like, are these happy tears? I'm like, yeah, it's happy tears. But just being able to have that depth of love and emotion and 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 crying, not necessarily from the shame or guilt of, of repressing things, but from the openness of love that it can give you. Because anger, while it can be, be negative in the body if it's stored and, and repressed and, and rejected and avoided when expressed in a healthy forward focused way it actually is a momentum it, it, it momenting I made up a word it's it's a motivating emotion on the scale of consciousness that actually can move you from those lower vibration negative states of like shame guilt and fear and move you into a place of acceptance neutrality love but we have, I think it's women when we allow ourselves to unlock that anger and like, what are we really angry about and not spewing it out on others, but being able to reflect and you, you have just do this so beautifully, your process of reflection. I, I know you genuinely take that process on a regular basis, on a daily basis. So that, that process of reflection of like, what, what is it that is really causing that anger? What do I actually need to give myself permission to be angry about? And then, and then allowing that, that to move you out of the shame and the guilt and into that next space. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just reflecting back to like, God, like there are so many, exp I, I was at a breath work retreat once. And mm -hmm. then um, just even recently like in a personal development training and like, 
the emotions like we are so afraid of sometimes just actually looking underneath that like like what am I making about this moment that is not true right like what is it like right now am I like so for me it used, used to show up in my relationship with my child like I it was so easy to get upset at him and then like not actually have the important conversations at work or with my you know other relationships and now that became a cue for me oh if I am becoming mad at my son what is it that I'm really upset about? Is it that I haven't eaten? I'm hungry. <laughs> it can I'm actually be the case, eat. especially as an right. entrepreneur where you're like, is right. it, did I skip lunch again? Did I skip lunch today? Or did I, am I lonely? Like, am I angry? Like, you know, am I alone right now? Am I tired? Right. So, uh, or what else? Right. So I think it's just um, every time there's those triggers are there or somebody sharing their trauma. Like I used to be that person where I would share and uh, like others would share it and I would be like crying, right? But now I am in this place where I can be the force of grounding. It my it breaks my heart, right? I, I get emotional, but then I'm also responsible for being that force of grounding where others can share there. Yeah. Right. And I think that's been the most transformative part in and fulfilling part when actually we own our emotions, we do the work on ourselves to actually. Mm -hmm. Um, not contribute to more triggers in this world, but actually the more healing in the world. And I know you're doing that both as a business owner and as a mom and, and now sharing your stories as a mom with your travels, with your, with your son mm -hmm. and a new book that's coming out. Tell us about that. Yes. It's a beautiful multi-author book called going places. And um, it's been so fulfilling Kim to write that book. Like my uh, it, it I talk a little bit about it's coming up in early October I was just reviewing all the manuscripts and like all the glorious reviews that we are getting in the meantime and I think the most fulfilling part of it has been reflecting about a trip that my son and I and my husband we did nearly eight years ago in China and then tying that back to the my first childhood trip with my parents for a month-long bus trip in India like nearly 40 years ago my dad was like literally in tears reading that book because that trip meant the world to him. Like in spite of like all the childhood like adversities he himself had from, uh, you know, um, the circumstances that were, he was in. But like it, it just gave me a newfound perspective of how the resilience flows in my generation. Like it's mm. just from my dad, from my mom, like they took a month long bus trip with two of their kids and so many full of strangers in southern from not eastern India to southern India like 40 years ago and my, that money that cost was almost two months of my dad's salary at the time it's a small amount but it was still like a big amount relatively for him it was a simple trip but I the travel has been the transformative part in my life because I also found safety in travel exploration and travel reading and travel so reflecting back now to go wow like um like how some of the things we do earlier on yes there are all these adversity but there are also positive experiences you know positive childhood experiences pces so travel was one of my those moments and i'm at a place in life where actually that's also something i'm looking to combine in the work i do going forward and just today um I'm simply thankful for being able to bring those stories and also writing with a lot of authors. Like it's just grown, like grown me personally. Mm. I'm so excited for the book. I'm so excited for it to come out. This I know this has been a long time coming. So I'm excited to, to read about your adventures. And we will definitely leave an, uh, a link to the book in the description. We encourage you to get it, leave a review, good one, and <laughs> and share it with, with those other those other people who may like, I mean, it's shocking to me that like, I think believe, I think the statistics like 30% of Americans still don't have a passport or haven't left their hometown and traveled within a few mile radius. Like it's that to me, travel is one of the best educators and for expanding possibility and perception and understanding different cultures and being more accepting of the diversity of this beautiful world that we live in. Yeah. And Kim, you talked about identity earlier. Travel is the one that actually can support you and make 
being fluid with your identity. Yes, a lot of people travel with privilege and things, but I do know travel transforms you. Like even the simplest of things, just going, eating in different culture, meeting people. And um, this book, uh, one thing I would add is also all the contributions are going to a, a, a charitable organization here that supports foster kids. Um, so that's again, like all the profits. So super proud of our publisher, you know, for also making that happen. That's amazing. That's amazing. Kalpa, I have loved our conversation and I would love to shift gears a little bit and shift into a little rapid fire. You ready? Oh, oh yes. That's the favorite part. Let's... I know you've been a long time listener of the podcast. So I'm like, you know, these questions, I think you're like already repped and ready to go. No, I almost forgot, honestly, until now. Like, I'm like, I don't remember now that you told me, I, rem I remember that there is that section, but I Honestly, I have no recollection right now. So who is your favorite female character in a book or a movie and why? So for me, it's really Oprah right now. Um, if you had told me two, it would be Michelle Obama and Oprah. Like I just see them together. Like uh, with Oprah, I think just the way with all her adversity, she's been able to come together, bring the, build this empire, like in the entertainment from like, a lot of the stories so she inspires me yeah and Michelle Obama like he only asked one but like from a like being married to a the best orator in our world you know times yeah. history like she's like that book like she herself is like I think has so much more influence like just describing the the, the grace she is the power she is the you know like challenging this identity of black angry women like you know, when people said that, like she took on that and like, like how hurtful it was, but at the same time, like how she, she's so gracefully, like just leaning into like book after book, right. And how continues to inspire. It's almost like, like I am, I, I look up to these women to go, what more is possible in the next decade, 20, 30, 40 years in my life. Exactly. What woman would you want to trade places with just for a day, live in their body alive or when they were alive, you know, years ago? Oh, Celine Dion. So, oh, <laughs> I, I love music. I love the stage. I mean, I think that's where I grew up, like, uh, uh, you know, singing and like performing. And so that's a key part of me. I'm again, like in the community here and we are performing again together. Uh, Friday evenings have music nights for me. So uh, what we performed at Texas Capitol earlier this year. So I'm like, yeah, I'm finding that music and performance to be more uh, in my life. And Celine Dion, I know she's also going through some challenges in her health, but at the same time, just how does one keep all of these things alive? You know, their, their music, their passion, their joy, and the realities of, you know, impermanence of our lives. And what a voice. Yeah. So what is your morning routine that sets you up for success? Mm, waking up a little bit earlier, right? Before my son wakes up. These days, that's only 15 minutes before he wakes up. <laughs> um, but normally, like, it starts with, like, um, meditation and then a cup of tea with my husband and then journaling and setting my intention, my planning, like, intention, affirmation, writing that. Yeah, those are... and then. Um, I do um, have exercise routine like baked into it, but the three, the first three that I mentioned, meditation, um, cup of tea with my husband and uh, journal journaling, right? Um, that is like consistent. And what is your evening routine to set you up for success? Sleep on time. <laughs> Go early. <laughs> what does on time mean? Well, on time means mostly we are done with dinner 9, 9.30. My phone is off usually by 9.30. Like I'm not engaging much in, you know, beyond that. And sleeping somewhere between 10 to 11. There have been some days in the phase of life that I'm in where I'm like probably not like sleeping by 10. But normally by and large, like 80, 90% of the time I'm like, I'm out by like 10 30 11 like nobody like I'm not talking and engaging with people for sure yeah yeah or or yeah. or scrolling my phone either amen yeah the scrolling we, the late yeah. night scrolling suddenly it's like oh 45 minutes later <laughs> I have an accountability partner right now um where we are like texting at like I'm like 9 28 she'll text me and if I'm not done by then it's her goal is like 10 so I'm like okay before sleep hey 
your phones off. So I think because what ends up happening, Kim, is like you go into corporate America. In the past, you didn't have all these continuous communications. And then you become used to the smartphone. And now even as an entrepreneur, you have all these like 20 different things, platforms we are dealing with. And sometimes phone, like at night, it's almost like you recreate the same thing if you're not careful. I know this is rapid fire. So. Oh, but I completely, I like, I am standing on that soapbox with you as far as like just the, uh, the intensity of the amount of connection that we have and even though it's not necessarily depth of connection, but it's a perception and illusion of a depth of connection that we think we have with all the platforms and all the the devices and all of that. And it, it can become super, I mean, it, these companies have spent trillions of dollars on studying human psychology to make their, to, to make free products be able to be highly, highly addicting in a way. Oh, absolutely. So just being able to manage our own addictions is, is so key. And I love that you have an accountability partner that's like, phone off. All right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's super supportive to be able to say like, nope, phone goes down, turn it off. You know, who's the best press. accountability partner? My son, like during the day, like 30 minutes of play, <laughs> like, yes. I, I sit down and he's like, mommy, you're late. And then the mom, you're late. You're not, you're not on time. You, you can't pick up the phone. You can't. So it's like our little ones teach us so many different ways, like the same things. Mm -hmm. Do you define to be your kingdom or your queendom? Oh, my kingdom, queendom is a space where only love and compassion in connection and abundance thrives like like literally a, a place of giving from a place of like pure 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 like um potentiality mm. and lastly how do you crown yourself listening to music reading books Kalpa, how do we find you how do we work with you and connect in all the places sure so my website is the company name connect so that's k-n-e-k-x-t dot com um we'll drop the link in the chat and then also my folks can find me on my uh, linkedin which is i go my full name is kalpa shri gupta so um, they will they can find me that way and then um i'm also active on tiktok with the connects.com name so we, folks can follow me and from a working perspective, um, I usually work with six to eight women in one-on-one -on -one coaching. The spots are usually limited because I like to have like three to three months to 12 months, you know, long-term relationships where we can work through some patterns. So those are the ways um, they can work with me and they can find, um, apply on my website um, to for a complimentary consult and we go from there. Yeah. And then uh, for engaging me for you know, pub public speaking, all the information is there on the website. They can, you know, find me. Um, Amazing. Yeah. And for someone who went from not being sure of their communication, you certainly have blossomed and done so, such extraordinary work in this world with not just the high achievers, but unlocking the truth behind the achievements. And I so admire what you're doing in this world and what you're creating. So with that, as always, my fellow sovereigns, own your throne, mind your business, because your reign is now. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If what you heard resonated with you, be sure to subscribe and start creating a bigger impact now by sharing this with a friend. Just by doing that one simple act of kindness, you are creating a royal ripple to support more people in their sovereignty. And if you're not already following on social media, connect with me everywhere at crownyourself.now for more inspiration. I am so excited to connect with you in the next episode. And in the meantime, go out there and create a body, business, and life that rules. Because today, you crown yourself.